All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> and hopefully you're seeing the right thing. Um, <clears throat> so this chapter is on uh, regression and prediction. Um, something that I thought was interesting that they pointed out uh, a couple times, I felt like, is um, that in statistics, when you learn about regression, it's kind of, you know, you're learning regression with the goal of like explaining why you get certain outcomes with the variables. So you, so you have a variable uh, or multiple variables and you're using regression to see if there's a correlation and hopefully therefore can explain like your ACT score, you know, um, has this relationship with your, uh, you know, college e exam scores, right? And so, um, but in data science, most of the time, I feel like is at least what was implied here is that um, typically regressions being used as a prediction. Um, and, and that uh, data scientists typically come at regression from that lens that, okay, this is what has his, happened historically. Um, and now we have this model and now we're going to be able to uh, predict what's gonna happen in the future. Um, as long as it's kind of within the same um, variation of the data we have seen, right? Um, and it does go into like that, uh, we gotta be really careful to not extrapolate. <laughs> um, the pandemic is a perfect example of this, um, is that it's very, very hard and pretty much impossible to make predictions of what was happening during the pandemic because we didn't have historical data on what happens during a pandemic. Uh, at least nothing relevant uh, since the Sp Spanish flu was, you know, over a century ago. But uh, <laughs> And all of our predictions that include 2020 and the training data are going to have problems in the future, presumably. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so that's, those are the points that I thought were really interesting and stood out to me. So the regression equation in its very, very simplest form um, with just, uh, just one X. Um, so you have your Y, your outcome, and you have a Y intercept and then a relationship to the variable X. Um, and this is called all kinds of things. Um, uh, y is the response, the dependent variable, Y variable, target. I like to use outcome. Um, it's just my personal preference. Um, and uh, for X, you have the independent variable, uh, the X variable, feature, attribute, predictor. So all, all kinds of names um, <laughs> for, for the same thing. Okay, so we can read this equation to mean that Y equals uh, B1 times X plus a constant um, B zero, or do you guys call this B null when it's a zero? Uh, B not maybe. B not, okay, yeah, B not. Um, I just have to giggle because I was like doing the same thing of, well, B zero, B not, like what's right yeah. to call it? I, I don't know what's right. 
Uh, but in my head, I think it's be not by not. default. Thank you. Um, so here's an example of some data that we have. And um, even visualizing it uh, with the scatter plot, um, it's maybe hard to tell what the trend is here. And um, this sample data is um, exposure to, what was it exposure to? It's measuring uh, cotton dust. So expo years of exposure to cotton dust um, to their lung capacity, it's this PEFR. Um, and then real quick, so R is really cool because it was designed to do just this. So we can use LM for uh, linear, uh, which is just a straight line and it uh, assign it to model. And so it tells us right here what our intercept is and the relationship to exposure. So we can kind of interpret this as um, for every year of exposure, um, lung capacity decreases by negative 4.2. I'm not familiar with PEFR, so I don't really know what how drastic negative four is. <laughs> I, I'm not sure, but it's negative and um, decrease in lung capacity is bad. I think we can all agree. So, uh, but you can also have these models to exclude a y-intercept and we do that by just adding this minus one. And then as you could see now, uh, now it just has 20, which I, I don't think that's a very good, uh, at least if you want to look at the model to be able to like interpret like what's happening here. I mean, in this case, excluding the intercept is saying model has to go through zero, zero. Yeah, right. right. So like, if you have no exposure, you have no lung capacity. It's kind yeah. of like you're nailing the model down to saying that, which doesn't feel right. <laughs> no, no. Um, it's probably only, it only makes sense when you have like a lot of variables, um, I would think. And yeah, I would just try to, try, try to think through um, Maybe, maybe the next example, that would make more sense, right? The next example is um, housing prices. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're using like the number of bathrooms and the number of bedrooms and the square feet and the size of the lot, right? If, if those are all zero, right? Your, your property is zero square feet and you have no rooms and you have no bathrooms, that would kind of make sense that the value would be zero because you're, you're, not you're not selling anything. So maybe in that situation, that would make sense, but not, not for this example. It was just mentioning how you can do it in R is take away that, that Y intercept so that it has to pass through zero. <laughs> and so uh, is, is that why the, the result there of 20 is so different from negative four? Because there was a sort of a negative trend, a slow negative trend when you include the, the um, when, I guess when you don't include, when you don't omit the y-intercept. So when the, the first version, it's negative four and there's a little bit of a slow trend, but then you hit, you put the negative one, force it all to go through zero, zero. And now it's, it's doing its best to make the data, the, the trend to be positive now. And it's, I guess that's, yeah. does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, because so it, it's saying that if you have zero exposure, you have zero lung capacity. Right. And so since you forced it to think that, it's like, well, but some of these have lung capacity, so I guess it must be a positive correlation. Um, right. And yeah. I think it's more um, the way that 
these, the linear regression line is calculated is that it's trying to minimize the residuals as much as possible. <laughs> so uh, yeah, when you force it to pass through uh, coordinate zero, zero, right? The way it's minimizing the residuals is trying to get up to this, you know, around 400 PEFR as fast as possible, right? To get that, get that line up there so that it's decreasing the residuals. And yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So, yeah, so this is, this is the original line uh, that, that has the intercept up here. So the 424 plus negative four times the variable times the exposure. So you get up here. So you have your Y intercept right here, your B naught, and then this slope down. And it's just showing that um, your, your coefficient for your exposure variable is that change in Y um, divided by the change in X. So uh, delta Y over delta X. And it's negative. All right, and this, so now we're kind of talking about um, the residuals. So um, this is kind of the formula that explains the original data, right? So if you picked a point and you used our, um, our linear model that we just did up here. So that plugs in for B naught and B1, but then we have our exposure somewhere on here, like 10 and, uh, but in our original data, sorry, let me. So if you pick a point, right, you're, you've got your exposure that lines up with that point and the outcome. And so if we plug in all of those values here, 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 and here, what you have left is this um, error, right? That takes us from that line, but then is able to move us up or down, wh whatever the case might be, to our original value that explains why. Um, and so, yeah, our when you're kind of going back to then apply the equation to try to fit um, the exact data points you had, um, there's this error here. Um, and so the formula for the predicted values is now this y hat, right? So we have a predicted y hat and the, oops, that's a typo. That's supposed to be a plus, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> plus there, not equals. So y hat uh, equals the b naught hat plus the b1 hat um, times our exposure. And um, yeah, and then our residuals are just calculated by taking our oh. original data point minus the predicted um, because this y hat is going to land on that line, on that perfect straight line that we drew. And so, so yeah, this is. Let me try to understand the, the hats here. Um, <clears throat> so, so y and y hats, I think I get like, um, you know, one's sort of the actual point and one's on the line. Um, <laughs> I know the book talked a bit about hats, but here we have also like in the the top line, the the EIs, the residu the whatever you call that term, doesn't have a hat, and the B not and B one don't have hats. So, is it correct to interpret this as like the top line here is some hypothetical reality where there's you know actual values of B not and B one that are somehow there. And then 
our model, all we can do is estimate D0 and D1, and that's why there's hats on those. Did you see where, where I'm? Yeah, yeah. That's... Yes. <laughs> that makes okay. sense to me. Yeah, that the unhatted is like the, you know, always like the real value, the, uh, I mean, it, it, sometimes it's population, sometimes it's sample, or it's not sample. Sometimes hat means samples, but because it's just, it's not the real thing. It's the, it's the like little piece. It's estimate, right? Yeah. It's like our guess or, you know, whatever whatever process we use to obtain that. Right. And so here it they've got the hats because they are predictions, they're estimated values. It's funny, I, I have not worked in a science that uses hats. Like it wasn't ever a thing that I remember in um, any courses that I had way back when, but you know, some courses love their hats. <laughs> yes. We use them differently for something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. It makes character encoding much more difficult. <laughs> That's all I know about the hats. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. So this is just showing us how in R we can find our fitted values here and our residuals uh, with R. And if you, um, I should have, if you plotted the residuals, uh, right, you're going to have positive and negative, and it's kind of centered around zero, uh, Y, and they're just going to be up and down, up and down, up and down. Because um, again, um, our, our linear line is uh, trying to minimize those residuals as much as possible, which is, um, which means typically you have kind of, well, it, it averages out to zero, right? With your positive residuals, your negative residuals. All right. Um, Trying to remember what I was doing here. <laughs> I, have a question. I have a question on the on the residuals, particularly like plotting them out. It, um, what would be like the value of a of a graph of the residuals? Um, I guess that if it's all closer to the line of zero, then you know that there's a higher correlation. But you can also get that from the from the final statistic, right? The R squared and um, I'm, I'm, I'm still recalling like a lot of this from many, many, many years ago. So if I'm not getting the words right, but, um, but I'm just wondering like the, the value of graphing the residuals, what can you interpret from that? Um, so, yeah, I think what you said correlation, I, I feel like I would do that as just an exploratory thing for my, to make sure I'm understanding the data, um, but potentially an outlier um, is maybe something I could see from the residuals here. That's true. Here, here's the residuals. <laughs> uh, I mean, not exactly, but these, the red dotted lines are kind of showing you what the residuals or the error, right? Um, what did I call that? The, what, explicit error? Um, but yeah, so like perhaps not this data, but if if I was seeing a lot clustered together on that zero line, but then one really stood out or um, it just kind of was un, 
And I would anticipate maybe a little like uneven because outliers can really pull, right? Pull that, um, influence the line um, when it shouldn't because it's just one value, but because it's so far away, right? It's, it's pulling that line up or down depending on where it is um, when it shouldn't. Uh, that's, I don't know, that's what comes to mind when I think about what, what information can I get from looking at plotting the residuals. Does anyone have any other ideas? So I have a question, hi, this is Pavitra. So that QQ plot or something like that, so is it possible just to see residuals without having um, the predicted versus like, I mean, like, can we actually see those lines themselves as a distribution? Is that what that QQ plot or something like that does? I don't know if it'd be QQ, but like if you didn't mean like a histogram on the residuals, something like that. Well, I mean, I remember that R has the ability to generate like four sets of uh, line graphs based on your residuals. And I'm wondering if I'm talking the same thing, but it's basically, um, it shows you how closely they are like um, concentrated or if they are like just a little bit all over the place, because then that means that there could be a possible, uh, um, they, there could be something there, like which explains the model. Like, um, and I, I could just be completely speaking nonsense, but it seemed like it was called QQ plot. <laughs> but, yeah, but the other question I had was, is it possible to see these lines, like the, 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 the residuals, like can we actually plot that in something just to see like the distribution of that? I mean, we totally can. Um, like you want me to try doing that now? <laughs> Well, no, I wonder if we have any inbuilt functions that enable us to do that and if anyone was familiar with that. Oh, no, no, no. I would I would think this, sorry, this is Stan. I have my video off. I would think this is a lot more informative actually because you can see like if you plot the predicted versus the residuals, you can see like where along the predicted values the the model starts to do a poor job at explaining the variability in the data. Um, and yeah, when you were going over this, like I, I read the R for data science textbook a while ago. And um, that was one of my biggest takeaways from the modeling section was like just plotting the residuals to evaluate the model fit, especially when dealing with nested models. Um, I, th I think there was one that was like looking at life expectancy um, in a bunch of different countries. And I forget what the metric was, but you could see that there were some um, using the same model for each different country, but running each country separately where the model just did a really, really poor job at explaining uh, the variability in the data. And that was just from looking at the residual plot. Um, so that, that, was the gap, that was the gap minder data set. And it's- Yeah, in, yeah, there you go. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, it's in chapter 25 of that book. I was just looking at it because I remember there were some plots of the residuals that came up there. Uh, I'm trying to see what the code was that actually plots that. Um, so once I once I see that, I'll, I'll mention it. Thank you for your questions of the conversation. I wish I knew the answers, but I, I don't. <laughs> yeah, don't worry when you don't know the answers, that's why it's a club. <laughs> All right. So All right. Multiple linear regression. So this is uh, this is the same thing, but now we have uh, multiple variables to predict our output. Um, so we have this data on house sales. And um, so we have the adjusted sale price, the square foot total of living space, the square foot of the lot, um, bathrooms. I'm confused a little bit about bathrooms. Is that just the space of the bathrooms? Not the number of bathrooms, I would think. That's funny. 
um, number of bedrooms and um, building grade. Now I'm really curious about those bathrooms. I figured it would it's, be the number of bathrooms, but no, I'm really looking at it. That's got to be square foot. That yeah. seems large-ish. There's zeros. Too. And there are zeros. Yeah. So the zeros are probably actually NAs. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't buy a house without a bathroom. <laughs> I'm not happy, guys. <laughs> um. I, I suspect, I don't know, but it almost looks like the columns are shifted over because like Ooh. square foot living, yeah. square foot uh, lot, like bathrooms, three and three quarters make sense as a bathroom. Well, two, one, 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 one also makes fun, it does. sense as a bathroom. Yeah. Um, yes, yes, yes. Bedrooms is the three. I'll bet. Well, how do you have 3.75 bedrooms? Hmm. See, like, I don't know, I, but yes, <laughs> so, I don't know if that was. Funny. Yeah, that's funny. How weird. Okay. Well, I, I was trying to use tidyverse instead of the yeah. read.csv, so I probably. Oh, oh you, oh, you did read TSV. Oh, did, yeah, because it, it's. Is uh, it? It is. Okay. Me, you know what? Let me just rerun this. <laughs> it's going to drive me crazy. And this is the beauty of our markdown. Yes. Let's replace the, if I can find it. Where are you? There it is. <laughs> One second. It doesn't want to. It doesn't want to do it the way that the original did it. Nope. Aaron file file. RT can open the connection. Is there uh, something wrong in the file name? I don't think so. Looks right to me. All right, well, we're going to pretend there's not an issue and I'll fix yeah. it next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so let's not draw too many conclusions about the true yes. yeah. value of houses in King County, but the, the, the way that it's run is fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, um, oh yeah, that's, that's gonna really mess us up. That's <laughs> okay, so, um, but in theory, um, we want to figure out how square foot to living, the square foot of the lot, the number of bathrooms, number of bedrooms, and the building grade, um, their relationship to our output, which is the adjusted sale price. Um, so yeah, don't look too closely at this, but um, have your intercept and then the coefficients to go with each um, variable. And then assessing the data. So if we just do summary, on the model. Um, tells us what, what we told it to do, right? As far as making the model. And now we have our residuals, right? We have our minimum first quartile, medium third quartile, and max for our residuals. And then our coefficients. So this is the, the coefficient that they're putting here and then the standard error, the T value and the um, P value, right? <laughs> Pretty sure that's what that's supposed to be. Yes. 
Um, we have degrees of freedom down here. Yeah, anyway, gives us gives us a lot of good information. So, anyone have anything to add? Well, I think so. I was trying to um, figure out what the the columns really are. And so it's interesting, like I think the one that's labeled square foot living is actually the square footage of the lot. And then it was. It's not going to be, be it's anyway. not going to be accurate, though, because the the adjusted sale price right here. That's isn't so that like this is supposed to be the square foot to living, I think. Oh, square foot to living. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because oh, wait, to, like, no, it's, it's not two, it's total. Down. It's total, not two. Yeah, total oh. living space, I think. So is it sale price in millions or something? I think the adjusted sales price is in millions or something like that. And oh, that's why you're seeing point nine. Okay. Yeah. So I think it is I think that column is correct. Okay. Ooh, thank goodness. But the the square foot total living is the biggest number, and the square footage of the living space can't be larger than the lot size. So I think that's the lot size. And then I think Can. that's probably. <laughs> you have multiple stories. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not sure what the 2111 column is. I think that the bathrooms column is actually the living square footage. Oh, you're right about multiple, multiple stories, Jonathan. Huh? But it's no, it's off by too much. Um, could Unless this these are multi acre? like one acre. <laughs> well, so I I don't know what building grade is on a scale of. I was thinking that might be building grade, and then because the bathrooms, like the the bathrooms, is the only number that should have point seven fives and point fives. I would think you can't have three point seven five bath or bedrooms. That doesn't make sense to me. But you could have four bedrooms, and then 3. I think 7, the building 5. grade is like on a, a six point. Scale. Anyway, yeah. I was, it doesn't really matter because <laughs> you know whatever the you know feature A through feature uh, E, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or F, feature A through feature F. <laughs> so, but yeah, we can still look at like the different um, levels, significance levels. All right. I see. So this is according to our intercepts, houses just start at what 0.8 million <laughs> or whatever the case might be. Yeah. In this data set. Yeah, right. All right, I'm happy to go back up, but <laughs> okay, model selection and stepwise regression. I, so stepwise regression. So we could, with our data, technically we could use every single variable that we have access to, to make a model, um, but that's not a good idea because there's um, there's a lot of noise and it actually points out that um, the noise doesn't hurt as much in uh, linear regression because it's a straight line. But if you were doing a different kind of regression where um, um, you know you gave your model, freedom to be more sine -y or cosine -y, uh, right? That, um, that prediction for the noise uh, becomes a, a way bigger issue if you're making it consider too many things and then um, it's just gonna cause problems. <laughs> it's not gonna, 
it seems like it's, it seems more accurate to the historical data, but it's not going to be as accurate for your actual uh, future variables that you're looking at. Okay, so stepwise regression is pretty much, um, well, it, there's two ways. Um, you can stepwise forward where it kind of adds one variable at a time um, and sees, you know, how, how well that's working for it. Um, and then eventually it will stop once it's like, yeah, adding another variable is not going to be beneficial. Um, and then there's backwards stepwise that um, starts with all of the variables and then just takes one off at a time until, um, until there's a pretty good fit. So, um, direction both. Okay, so this one, so we're still working with our sales, our, our house sales. Um, and this is step AIC, which is, I knew this, but now I have to look it up. <laughs> there are too many pages to look through. Where did you go? Oh, there it is. So. Oh, you could go ahead. No, I was uh, going to try to uh, help, just help rescue you because it is a <laughs> lot of pages, but uh, it's, was it a Kaiki a, a a information criteria? I don't think I've ever actually heard that pronounced out loud. Um, the, the A. A Kaiki? A Kaiki? So it was created by uh, Hiro Tugu Akaike. Um, and so, yeah, so Akaike's information criteria is what that AIC stands for on page 157. Um, so then there's all kinds of variations, but the one we're using in this example is Akai K's information criteria. So this is direction both. So it's going forward and backwards to try to find the best, um, the best model with the correct and right number of variables to consider. So, Trying to I'm trying to figure out is this increasing or decreasing? Start step. Did you step up or down? Down. Okay. So this is so as you scroll down, it's slowly taking off variables. So I'm not familiar with this function. I've never seen it before. Should, it's showing me, so what I'm interpreting is that it's showing me its steps that it took. So it started with all the variables, I think, maybe not. And then it's showing me taking off the worst one one at a time. So it's step, step, step. Should I assume this last one is the one it's recommending? <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the general idea here, right, is that adding more 
uh, variables, predictor variables, should never make your model worse technically, but it does make it more complicated. And I, isn't AIC kind of like trying to balance, is the gain worth the, the additional complexity? And so AI, I guess it, it reaches a point where, I, I think this last one is probably, or is it the second, like, I don't, I don't know, but at some point it says, okay, all these variables are worth including in your model. And then, right, then it's the, yeah. that maximizes the AIC or is it minimizes this? I don't know, <laughs> which way does that go? Right, I think I remember now. Um, so you're right, the more variables, the better your model, but um, in statistics, uh, the, it's, yeah, simplicity is like number one, holy grail. Um, but there's also the fact that there are variables that are like very related to each other. And when you're, when you're using both of them, um, it's their coefficient um, isn't, an accurate explanation with its its relationship to the output because they're they're um, conflicting with each other because they're explaining the same thing. <laughs> you want? Well, I think that's a concept of multicollinearity, I believe. I'm so sorry. What did you say? Multicollinearity. So that's one of the assumptions yeah. of uh, regression, right? That we. We don't want to keep uh, multiple collinear, uh, basically highly correlated variables um, together. So you want to, like in, in your, in, in the steps or in the process of when we are eliminating the um, variables, that's one of the things you want to uh, take care of. And we remove the highly correlated or multicollinear variables. That's right. Thank you. direction is this number going? It is. Is there like a summary function that you could just print on the your step LM object that would give it to you maybe? So here's step LM. So does this end up being the same thing? Your built square foot, finished basement, sorry, let me go, one, two, three. And I'm trying to remember, does the step function do like interaction terms as well, or is it just additive? I don't know. <laughs> this step LM has less variables than the last one in the AIC. Okay, so I guess it makes sense that that's probably the, the last. I guess one thing, I, I didn't read this chapter yet, so this is kind of just like um, thinking generally about this, but um, like good stopping rules for like AIC or when you deal with BIC, like, um, you know, typically you would just choose like the lowest AIC or BIC, um, I don't, I don't know if they re like talk about BIC, but it's basically AIC, but you get an additional penalty for the number of variables that you include. So it's a bit more stringent, but um, like at a certain point, you're just getting kind of marginally smaller. And um, like Jonathan talked about, you're increasing model complexity for maybe describing a little bit more variability. Like, does anybody have any thoughts on uh, stopping rules? Like after X amount of drop in AIC or BIC, we're going to call it, or? Well, I know I don't. <laughs> also, if that made no sense, then I'll just stop talking. <laughs> no, no. I, 
Thank you. Um, it mentions BIC. It gets one little sentence in this book, but it, right. it, it, it mentions it. I, I thought it was a great question, and I can't wait until I can answer it confidently. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, I mean, I think this was more, or this may be more appropriate for like, um, like classification where like I've, I've, I've done this in genetics where you're like looking at how many clusters are there and you can always try to whittle it down to more and more and more, but then eventually it starts to not really make sense uh, or not make sense, but your, your gains are, are pretty marginal. Um, but maybe we can, yeah, table that. For I now. think um, you're also a lot more likely to have problems with new data if you get, yeah. If you like over these... cluster or yeah, right. or over split. Yeah. You're, if you're using some variable that really doesn't have a relationship, but you tell the model it has to have a relationship, so it's going to find one, and it's going to be what is the relationship in this exact set of data. And right. So that's something to really watch out for. Yeah, you can't really generalize to new data. Right. Um, and then I think this was just to show the difference between, um, you know, that just using bed, the number of bedrooms to determine uh, the sale price of the home is um, too... <laughs> Uh, not not good on its own. Um, well, and it does make sense, but um, and the reason it makes sense is because if you're not changing, if you're not increasing the size of the house with the number of bedrooms, the value of the home actually goes down when you just make smaller and smaller bedrooms to fit the same size <laughs> of the house. No one wants small bedrooms. Um, so that was oh, just, go ahead. Just that, but we don't know if that's what we're actually seeing right. in this exact example. <laughs> right, anyway. Yeah. Well, that was, that was just a fun little thing to throw in there. Um, and yes, I, if it's okay with everyone, um, I'm not going to go further into the chapter for today um and that's where that's, we'll, i was gonna say i think that worked out perfect or we'll pick pick up i'm so glad because <laughs> i felt really bad i was like i did not get very far <laughs> and now we have a little break uh everyone can get caught up <laughs> so we're gonna take two weeks off um we'll be back on the 12th i think it is um, and we will continue with chapter, yeah, it is to the 12th. We'll continue with chapter four. Um, I mean, this is, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a thick chapter. There's a lot going on, obviously, since we made it about, you know, halfway through ish <laughs> in an hour. So, hey, John, can I ask a, just a question about linear models in general? So, <clears throat> um, without a whole lot of experience in the, in the realm. Um, I'm, is, is it safe to say that a linear model can apply regardless of the data set, the industry, the age of the data, like linear models will always apply. There just may always be a better alternative. Is that, is that safe to say, or, or would you kind of, maybe jump past a linear model and choose a different kind of model because you're in a certain industry or you have certain data or you need a certain answer? Uh, always is a, a scary word, but... <laughs> but yeah, I was going to say the answer to this would be it depends. Right. Uh, I mean, linear models are often um, a way to describe things. They won't always work great and it you know, certainly often won't be the best, but a lot of people, um, like I think in some of Julia Sogi's uh, 
modeling videos, she'll still do a linear model as the first thing, just to kind of get a feel for, you know, which variables matter. Um, is there anything, is there a here, here, you know, is, does it, do I see anything with a linear model? And then we can start really diving in and trying to figure out which features, how to make the, you know, this linear model says this feature doesn't, you know, says bedrooms doesn't matter. That doesn't make sense. So what am I doing wrong? That kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I think even now with, you know, they're pretty advanced modeling techniques. Um, one, one of the thing, the reasons that linear models are so persistent is, I mean, if you think you have any, any old curve, like even in multi-dimensions, over a small enough region of your space, it'll look like a line, unless it's really pathological and has kinks in it. So um, linear models, like it's almost safe to say, but always is a scary word, <laughs> but like if you narrow your, the range of your data and your domain, like if you zoom in enough on it, then the linear, then any complicated model you have will start to look like a linear model. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so. Oh, I guess the other thing is that linear models are so easy to interpret. Like they're the easiest to interpret. You, it's this variable has this much impact. Okay, you know, like I can understand exactly what that means. Um, and so that's where they're still like if if a linear model works for your data, it's really you know that's great because then you can start saying okay, if I want to have a higher housing price, you know, I look at which number has the biggest impact. That's what I have to increase. Or, um, you know, if I want to find a cheaper house, so oh, I can just lower that house, that number. Um, okay. But again, they're not always, you know, the the best fit. It's just an easy fit or an easy to understand fit. So, so recognizing that always is a scary word, it, it's a good place. Linear models are generally a good place to start, at least. For I think, th or, <laughs> yeah, they're a good thing to include in the tool toolkit. Now there will be cases where you're like, yeah, a linear model's not going to do anything here. Um, if I am trying to uh, predict the sentiment of a piece of text, like feeding that into a linear yeah, model yeah, is yeah, difficult. The text, yeah, of course, with text, <laughs> you know, obviously linear regression doesn't sort of work well. But um, I, I think I do want to emphasize that uh, the concept of simplicity in, in your models, uh, I think that is something that makes me say, uh, you know, I'm leaning towards Ryan, what, is, what Ryan is saying is, you know, we should, at least this should always be the start um, to begin with, because uh, like, you know, John, you were mentioning, so you learn a lot of, a lot about your data, about your model, and then you can um, approach towards moving towards complex model. And even then there might be scenarios or there might be, you know, um, times that when you would actually make complicated models, but still your, you know, error rate would be much lesser with, um, with still, with, with still with the linear model. Um, so that, I mean, drives to the point that even if, you know, you try a certain complicated models, it'll still be, Linear can still end up being um, um, easier yet more accurate model. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Morgan. Yeah, thanks, Morgan. You're very welcome. Um, I'm happy to present the next part to the continuation of chapter four, or happy to pass it on whenever, whenever you guys want to do. Um, if there, let's talk in the channel, but, it, um, yeah, if anyone would like a shot at presenting, it is a great way to, to dig into the material. Um, and we can get Morgan's, uh, stuff that is done up onto the repo. So you can just continue from there. Um, Andy says that he's able to present if you would like a break. And I, I think that's great. We don't have that many chapters, so splitting up chapters is good for everyone to have a chance. So we'll assume that Andy's going to present in uh, three weeks. We're going to skip two weeks and then, then we go. All right. Very Sounds cool. <laughs> and yeah, thank you very much. Bye. That's everyone.